Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My special guest today, Jason Furman, the former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House. Jason, great to have you on the show. Great to be here. So uh, I, I know you haven't been uh, away from Washington for that many years, but how do you think Washington has changed in the brief time since you left the White House? I think everything that was bad about Washington has basically gotten worse. The amount of polarization, the amount of anger, the amount that people are distracted from the real issues and run around chasing things that aren't um, the real issues. Um, and then, of course, the White House has changed quite a lot from one where I'd like to think we had an excellent process to one that might be a little bit less disciplined than, than what we the way we ran things. Well, you know, when you look back on the Obama administration, and especially uh, when you consider what has been happening and is happening with the Trump administration, uh, what would you have done differently? What would you have encouraged the president, President Obama, to have done differently? If you had had the foresight, uh, which would have been difficult for anyone, uh, to know what's going on today. You know, I, I was just on the economic side, so I'm sure there may be all sorts of other things in terms of how one, um, you know, dealt with all sorts of issues. Um, on the economic side, I'm not sure I would have done anything super different. Um, you can't constrain your successor, and if your successor wants to undo some of the things you do, um, they can do that. Something like the Affordable Care Act was, you know, benefited enough people that even though it wasn't incredibly popular with the public, when it came to taking things away from those people, um, that was a lot harder than Republicans expected. And I think that was a testament to if you do you know, good policies, they'll be you know, at least a little bit more resilient than, than other types of policies. Well, on the other hand, though, uh, President Trump and his, you know, his side, his team, as it were, they've been actually... Uh, pretty effective in dismantling the Affordable Care Act or certain, certain portions of it and in a manner whether they realize it or not could lead to really the demise of most of it. Is that a, an accurate statement or not? Look, if you ask me, is our health system better today than it was in 2008? So you have the Affordable Care Act plus everything President Trump has done. It's much, much better today. The number of uninsured is down. Health costs actually are growing more slowly than they were growing in the past. So I think getting rid of some things like the individual mandate, trying to undermine those private insurance markets, I think that's definitely a minus, but it's more like taking away 20% of you know what I view as the goodness of what passed. All right. Well, that's a, an optimistic, uh, optimistic appraisal, and I, and I certainly hope you're right. In terms of opportunities, though, uh, one of the opportunities I thought the president had that he didn't take advantage of was the Simpson Bowles Commission, uh, where former U.S. Senator Al Simpson, who's been a guest multiple times on the show, uh, and former White House Chief of Staff Erskine Bowles, uh, really put together a kind of a compromise plan to address some of the most serious issues facing the country financially in terms of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, tax structure, uh, et cetera. And uh, although they didn't get the supermajority that they needed to force Congress to uh, either accept or reject the proposals, they had a majority of the commission voted in favor of their recommendations. They presented them to the president. Uh, and when it came to Congress, the House, when it came to the Senate, and the White House, there was really, from what we saw, little or no action on that report. Do you think that was a mistake? In retrospect, should the president have provided more leadership to get those proposals implemented? You know, I think the president did go out pretty far, provided a lot of leadership, got closer to a fiscal deal than a lot of people appreciate. I think, if anything... I wish maybe we'd gone a tiny bit further with that. I don't know that it would have worked, but I would have liked to exhaust you know, all the alternatives. You know, stepping back, the basic principles of Simpson Bowles were to deal with our deficit. You need to deal with revenue and spending. Those both need to be on the table. And when you deal with spending, you shouldn't be cutting spending programs that benefit um, the vulnerable, that benefit the poor. I think those two principles are exactly right. President Obama put out something that had revenue, that had savings on entitlements, that protected the poor. We went into a negotiation with Speaker Boehner. We went very far. 
We had Medicare age 67 on the table, raising retirement age for Medicare. We had reducing the indexation of Social Security benefits. Both of those were offers that President Obama made. Um, he was asking for much less revenue than was in the Bull Simpson Commission. I think it would have been really hard to get the Republicans on board, because if you remember, people like Paul Ryan all voted against it. But yeah, I think maybe we should have tried just a little harder to exhaust every possibility. All right, and it's easy to play you know, Monday morning quarterback, as it were. Uh, do you think, in, in retrospect, there were some things that the president could have conceded or could have given up that would have actually um, got him, gotten him across the, the goal line, as it were? You're really bringing me back. I was in every one of those well, meetings and negotiations yeah. seven years ago. And, you know, look, we were asking for $800 billion of revenue. Simpson Bowles had $1.6 trillion of revenue. So we were asking for half as much as what they had on revenue. If you looked at our long-run Medicare savings, we were proposing even more long-run Medicare savings than were in um, Simpson Bowles. So I think President Obama was willing to compromise um, quite a lot and you know, did have a, a great set of discussions with Speaker Boehner that I think fell apart probably because he knew he wasn't going to be able to get his caucus on board for a deal. All right. So how public, uh, in, in this, once those negotiations occurred, uh, how well known is it in, in terms of what the president was willing to do? Is that, is that you know, widely known or not? Right. At the time of the negotiation, um, it was great. Nothing leaked. We talked for two months without a single leak. Everything broke down, went into a different format, um, and everything started to um, leak. Now, my, I call it a leak. You would call it transparency. Um, I call it informing the public. Uh, informing the public. But I think sometimes you need to you know, figure some things out behind closed doors and then share it with the public and, and give the public time to evaluate it. Um, I think a, a lot of what I just said is known. I'm not sure if you know, some of that might be brand new. All right. So well, who knows? Well, and, and how about now? And tell me what's happened. I mean, in the past and even during that time, uh, I think Republicans, some Republicans were seen as very concerned about uh, spending on, on, on Medicare, on Medicaid, on Social Security, uh, but on the overall budget, that, that large uh, annual federal deficits were not a good thing, uh, that increasing the national debt was not a good thing. Uh, that seems to have been tossed out the window. What happened? I have no idea. I mean, if you look at 2010, 2011, our deficit was entirely justified by the cost of fighting the recession, and the deficit was falling really rapidly. Now, there's no excuse at all. I mean, if you look at the history of when the unemployment rate's been below 5%, the deficit's average 0.3% of GDP. Right now, the unemployment rate's below 4%, and the deficit is about 3.5% of GDP. So we're in really uncharted territories in terms of a deficit that's large and rising in an economy that's, that's quite strong. All right, and, and what uh, I think a lot of people don't understand really the peril of, of this situation and, and the danger in the sense that you have an economy that a lot of people describe as being at full employment. You have interest rates still at, at relatively historic lows. Uh, this is a time when we should, it, it should be as easy to have a balanced budget as we're going to have. Uh, instead, you have deficits increasing, massive deficits ahead uh, under the Trump administration. And, and if we have increases in interest rates, which I think everyone assumes we're, well, we're already having them, the question is to what extent are those increases going to be? What does that portend for the future in terms of uh, annual deficits, the national debt, economic policy, and the impact on the American people. You have yeah. 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, deficits leave us poorer. Deficits leave us less prepared for contingencies in the future. I think it's unlikely the United States will face a fiscal crisis. We're a large economy. We borrow in our own currency. We have our own monetary policy. But even without a crisis, interest rates are a bit higher. Investment is a little bit lower. We have to borrow more from abroad, and we're going to have to repay all of that in the future. So through every one of those mechanisms, you know, the growth of our national income um, will be lower than it would otherwise have been. Um, and then if we face some unexpected event in the future, um, we're going to have less room to deal with it. 
Well, and certainly um, running a deficit isn't automatically a bad thing. If you're making investments uh, in the country, and whether it be in education or infrastructure, whatever, the job retraining, whatever it may be, where you expect some kind of payback. Uh, I think the danger really is when you're spending money and you're, you're not getting a return. Uh, on that money, and that certainly is uh, an accusation that could be made against probably any uh, any administration. Respond to that before you take a break. Yeah, first of all, I think even if you're investing, there's no reason not to pay for it. I think building highways would help our economic growth. I think building highways and paying them for them with a gas tax that makes people use those highways better than they would have otherwise would help our growth by even more. Well, the federal gasoline tax hasn't been raised in years. And if it were adjusted for inflation, uh, there'd be more than enough revenue to pay for all the infrastructure, uh, maintenance, repairs, and uh, additional uh, construction of roads, for example, uh, in the country. Why wasn't that, why didn't that happen under the Obama administration? It's just incredibly unpopular. And I think that's really unfortunate because from the 1950s through the 1990s, just about every president from both parties went to the American people and said, I'd like to do more for you on highways, but you're the ones who use the highways. You're going to be the ones that have to pay for the thing that you're using. So we're going to raise the gas tax a little bit. Um, when President Clinton, who's the last president to do that, did it, um, he was really demonized, and no one has wanted to come near it since, even though when I was in the White House, I had the Trucking Lobbying Association come in asking me for a higher gas tax. They wanted to pay higher gas tax as long as all the money went to our highways. So I think you know, there's a constituency out there for it, just not a large enough one. Evidently not. Well, no one likes to uh, pay for what they have to, have to do or what they want to do. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with Jason Furman in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse, and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. The Rexile Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication, is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24 7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. We are with Jason Furman. So, Jason, I'd like you to talk a little bit about growth and inequality, the fact that you know, we have an expanding economy, uh, but we also have a growing gap uh, between those at the top and those at the bottom. Uh, what's actually happening, and what are the implications for that for our society? Yeah, I think the fundamental economic challenge facing the United States is that the typical family's income is growing at about half a percent a year used to grow at about 3% a year, so it used to double once a generation, 
Now it takes over a century um, to double. And that's happened really because of a double whammy. Since the 1970s, growth has slowed. Um, productivity growth has been very slow. It's had its ups and downs. Recently, it's been more down than up. Um, and then at the same time that the pie isn't growing as fast as it used to be, it's being divided increasingly um, unequally. And the share of income going to the top 1%, for example, um, has doubled. And so the combination of those two, slower growth, rising inequality, has really um, hit families and hit them for some time now. All right, so how do we change that trajectory? I think there is no one cause of it, and there's no one solution. The most exciting is if you can figure out ways to help growth while reducing inequality. I think expanding education, expanding opportunity, taking advantage of all the talented people who have a lot to contribute to our economy, you know, but are being shut out of it in different ways. Um, I'm worried about the rise of um, concentration, that you know, businesses are getting larger. It's harder for small new businesses to start up. Our economy is increasingly dominated by you know, oligopolies, whether it's in airlines, brewing, your local hospital, um, and what have you. I think that's another thing that's making it a little bit harder for us to be as dynamic and innovative as we used to be and also um, concentrate some of the benefits at the very top. You reference the uh, the income, the slow growth of income, especially for for middle class families. Uh, what are middle class families? What can they do? What kind of national policies could we consider that that might change that? Uh, and of course, obviously, uh, the best thing that that can happen for everyone is a, a growing a, an economy growing faster than it is today. But is the economy perhaps uh, at a point size wise where uh, looking at a three or four or five percent annual growth rate is unrealistic, or, or is that uh, a, a reasonable possibility? Yeah, I think three percent growth is unfortunately very unrealistic. Um, the biggest impediment we have is the most predictable fact about the economy, um, which is our aging population. And our demography, we had this baby boom, um, now we have a retirement boom. It's that same generation is retiring. And that retirement boom is a big drag on our economic growth. You combine that with our slower productivity growth, and that means I think a reasonable forecast would be 1.5 to 2%. We may end up getting lucky. We may get higher than that. But I don't think it would be responsible um, to predict that we're going to. Well, you also have, uh, in reference to that, approximately 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day. Uh, and that's putting demands on Social Security, on Medicare, uh, in some cases Medicaid as well. As well. Uh, and the ratio, of course, of the number of workers to uh, recipients of benefits has just changed drastically uh, over the past uh, several decades. Uh, what does that portend? Because uh, that, I think those ratios are not going to get better. We're used to have, you know, 16 uh, people working and, and for every one recipient, now it's whatever, like three or, or you know, right. three and a half. Uh, I don't see those numbers and those ratios changing, do you? Right. So that's absolutely a really important challenge. I don't see those ratios changing. But let me tell you what could make some of a difference is immigration. If we didn't have immigrants over the next decade, our workforce would actually be falling. If you want to look, know what it looks like for a country with a falling workforce, look at Japan and what their economy looks like. Um, we're going to have immigrants in this country. That's going to mean a rising workforce. If we had more immigrants, we'd have even more people out there working to support all those retirees that you were talking about. Um, and immigrants also bring with them a lot of entrepreneurialism, starting new businesses, innovating, dynamism. Um, so I think it would help with a lot of our economic challenges. All right, you need to talk to the current president a little, <laughs> little more often. Uh, what about the, the, the shape of the configuration of the workforce? Uh, uh, certainly, uh, if you look just uh, uh, starting several years ago, a, a major trend towards people dropping out uh, of the workforce, where at one point we had almost uh, 100 million people uh, who were able-bodied, uh, well, not all able-bodied, I take that back, but 100 million people uh, of workforce age who are not working. Of course, a big part of that uh, included people who are retired, uh, people who are students studying who normally wouldn't be 
uh, having jobs or certainly full-time jobs. But uh, a, a significant portion of that were people who had been in the workforce, and especially uh, older men. Talk about those numbers and, and what's happened, and how do we address those challenges? Yeah, so, so I'm not worried, as you said, about a 17-year-old that's not in the labor force, and I'm not worried about an 87-year-old um, that's not in the labor force. Economists sometimes like to focus on what they call prime age workers. No disrespect to those that aren't prime age, but 25 to 54 is the standard definition. Um, if you look at that group of men, it used to be that 98% of them were in the workforce. Now it's down to 88%. That's happened over 50 years. And that's a massive economic challenge. It brings with it a whole host of problems. Um, you look at women in that age group, their participation in the workforce increased by leaps and bounds in the decades after World War II, but that peaked in 2000, and they also, since 2000, um, have been withdrawing from the workforce, um, which is remarkable because in just about every other advanced economy, you know, women are continuing to enter the workforce. So what happened? A whole lot of things, but the most important is just a reduction in demand for unskilled workers whether because of um, technology, globalization, immigration, whatever your favorite explanation is, people just didn't want to hire people with less skills. And that meant they paid them less, which is more inequality, and some of them didn't get jobs at all or didn't want to take a job um, at that lower wage. I think that's the biggest part. Um, but there's other things going on as well. Um, mass incarceration that we've had in the United States when people exit prison um, and jail, very hard for them um, to get jobs. The opioid epidemic has been both a cause and an effect um, of this. For women especially, we lack child care, paid leave, um, and some of the other um, policies that I think would help enable more people who wanted to work to do so. Well, the most dr dramatic numbers were certainly for white males, I believe, uh, in terms of just the sheer numbers who left the workforce, who could be in the workforce. Why did, uh, we, we understand why they left the workforce, but where did they go? How do they survive if they're not in the workforce? And uh, what are the implications for the numbers of people who apply for disability, the numbers of people who apply early for Social Security, those kinds of factors as well. Right, so um, actually only a small portion of the increase, less than a sixth of it, is people who have gone on disability insurance. And most of these men are not getting disability insurance. And in fact, other cash benefits from the government um, have gone down and are harder to get now than they were um, 30 years ago. Um, these men aren't married to working women, we know that. Um, so they're getting money from a combination of you know, family members, occasional types of work from um, different social services. And you know, in general, though, our, um, you know, it's not just the lack of money that concerns me, but that does. It's the you know, exclusion and marginalization from society that happens when you've dropped out of the workforce you know, involuntarily and get stuck there. All right. Well, uh, let's look at it as some great potential, maybe, for expansion. I think there's of the a economy. lot of potential. All right. We're going to take our last break. We'll be right back with Jason in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. The Rexal Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who, through leadership, skill, and dedication, is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator, and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations.
just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind-the-scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24 7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. This is part one of our special two-part series with the former chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Jason Furman. Okay, Jason, I'm really intrigued by your look into the future, uh, especially with uh, AI, with artificial intelligence. Uh, we're seeing the automation of vehicles, predictions in the trucking industry that in, you know, in a decade, uh, literally uh, hundreds of thousands and, and maybe millions of drivers, especially if you look at uh, services such as taxis or even ride sharing, uh, if that becomes so automated that you no longer need drivers, so many people are going to be out of work. Uh, talk about what other fields are going to be impacted and kind of your view of, of what the labor force, uh, the challenges it may face in 10 years and what it may look like in 20. Mm -hmm. So I think AI is enormously exciting. It's going to make all sorts of improvements um, in our life. But I don't think it's that new a thing for the workforce. We've been dealing with automation for 200 years now. And there were a million telephone operators. They all lost their jobs because you became able to call people um, directly. So I always I think, wanted to be a horse and buggy driver myself. So. Right, N none of those, but an awful lot of people in the auto industry now. So I think there'll be new jobs. I think there are always jobs turning over. Um, but I think we haven't coped with the transition super well in the past. And so this round, because we're thinking more about it in advance, maybe we'll cope a little better on helping people have the skills they'll need to navigate. All right. What do we need to do to do that? What can we do to help people get those skills? Um, the first thing is education. The, the, if you look at the jobs that are likely to be automated, if you have a high school degree or less, most of those jobs are potentially something you can automate. If you have a graduate degree or more, very few of them. You know, people talk about the radiologists, but you know, most of those jobs aren't. Now, I'm not saying everyone can get a graduate degree, but pushing everyone up one notch on the educational spectrum reduces the degree to which they're going to end up competing with AI, competing with robots. Um, a second thing is to understand that we're not completely sure whether the skills you're going to need are more soft skills, interpersonal management, type of judgment, creativity, or hard skills, coding, math, and the like. Right now, I bet on the soft skills because I think the computers are going to be really good at all of the math, coding, um, and the hard skills. So more, more um, you know, interpersonal, because that's what we can't replace. All right, a call to abandon STEM by Jason Furman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just don't think STEM's going to solve all our problems. Uh, so. I'm just teasing. Jason, thanks so much. Okay. We will continue the conversation. All right, that's the end of part one of our special two-part series with Jason Furman. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.